So before we start, um, I will play a short video. Okay, so what you just experienced was um, what a person without sight would experience when navigating the web and when using a screen reader to get information from the website. Now, of course, if that information is, I mean, if, if the owner of the website properly takes care of accessibility, that person will be able to experience the web in a similar manner as, as we experience it on, on the visual channel, but it's not always the case. So today we're going to talk about accessibility, um, but not only for visually impaired people, we're going to talk about various degrees or angles of accessibility, and we're going to see that it goes even beyond uh, disabilities. So my name is Alex. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Alex and Moldovan, and I hope you see the link in the, in the footer here if you want to get the slides later, they are already online on bit.ly slash vox-cluj-alex. Uh, there are a bunch of links, especially in the lower part of the screen here, so you can catch the links afterwards. Uh, I also already tweeted uh, the slides, so make sure you have get access to them if, if you want to, to catch the links later. There are a lot of like references to articles and stuff like that. Um, I work at a company here in Cluj called Teleport HQ. Uh, we are building tools uh, for developers, designers in this area of like code generation, wireframe to code, and all sorts of crazy experiments. Uh, we'll soon be launching um, our SaaS platform, and we have like a, an opening event on the 7th of November. If you look us up online, uh, it's here in Cluj, it's free, so you can uh, come check out what we're working on. I also want to give a, a, a small shout out to, to the local JS Heroes community here. Uh, in case you're interested, in case you haven't heard about us, JS Heroes is the local JavaScript community and the conference JS Heroes is happening next year on the 23rd and 24th of April. Um, and I'll be looking forward to seeing you there. So enough about me and bragging about stuff. Uh, let's actually talk about the topic today. A lot of people ask me, like, why do I talk about accessibility? And mostly the reason is because not a lot of people are talking about it. And it's a pretty important uh, topic, in my, in my opinion. And also, I think that um, it's, it's interesting to see, basically, beyond the, the, the scope of like our small, like say, let's say development, uh, development environment to see, okay, who are the users of our uh, interfaces? How are they using the interfaces? How are they interacting with our services and so on and so forth? So in this talk, I'm going to try to get you through a couple of stages that I personally went through when I started understanding what accessibility is about. And we're going to start from the first one uh, awareness, right? That uh, at the at the beginning, at the first stage, you have no idea what uh, you maybe no have no idea what accessibility is about. Uh, in this case, according to Wikipedia, accessibility is the design of products, devices, services, um, or environments for people with disabilities. And I really like this definition, but specifically, I like highlighting some things here. Accessibility is designed for people. So in order to truly understand accessibility, it's not about looking at what are the necessarily the specifications, what are the standards, you know, things like that. It's actually understanding that what we're building is used by people, so that in order to build a better product, we must understand who those people are and how, what are their needs and how we can better serve them. Um, accessibility is standardized under the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Uh, it's an each part of the W3C initiative. They basically run most of the standards of the web. Uh, and it, you can find it on the link online. You can find pretty much all the information about 
accessibility on all different categories and um, all, different, all, the, all the different standards involved. Um, now that we understand what it is, like let's say fundamentally, the first stage that we get to is some, the stage I call like the misconception stage. This is, there are a lot of misconceptions about accessibility and I just picked three of them to, to highlight maybe the most, let's say, dangerous misconceptions of, of them all. So number one, our country does not have accessibility regulation. And I'm not talking about our country, specifically Romania, I'm talking about how a business person would argument that uh, when, when someone says, hey, why should we have support for, I don't know, screen readers? And they say, well, you know, in Germany or in France or in Romania, uh, no one can actually sue you because you don't have an accessible uh, interface. This is a misconception uh, and it's the dangerous one, of course. First of all, the WCAG standard is adopted in a lot of countries in the world. It's adopted in the European Union. Uh, it's adopted in, the, in, uh, the, in North America, a lot of countries in South America, Asia. Uh, and all the, public, uh, all the public websites, so government, everything that's related to, to the public sector is constrained basically to adopt uh, this as their standard. What some of these countries don't have is the legal regulation by which a private company can, uh, a private uh, person can sue a private company. Uh, that's only happening in the States. Maybe you heard recently about Domino Pizza getting sued for not having an accessible interface. There are a lot of other examples like this. Um, it's, for example, Denmark and the UK have some sort of regulation. It's basically, you can imagine it at, at some point there will be something like GDPR happening in the entire European Union. And then basically it's the same thing as private individuals will have certain rights when it comes to accessible interfaces. So it's only a matter of time. The next one, we don't have users with disabilities. This is an, another kind of argument that people, uh, people say. And the, the real problem here is that most of the times people are not looking at the right data set. And to draw a parallel with this, and why, to, to explain why this is a misconception, um, I have this example. So in the Second World War, the, the British RAF was trying to figure out how to better armor their planes, right? And they were looking at all the planes that were coming back from battle, um, seeing where the bullets, where the bullet holes were in the planes. And they, statistically, they said, okay, we're going to armor these parts because this is where most of the bullets were. What they were missing from the statistics is the planes that were nev never coming back to base. So the planes that were getting shot down. And those planes, of course, had the bullets in the engines and in the cockpit area. So similarly, by saying that our website does not have users with disability, we're basically uh, not looking at the right data set. Because if we are not providing an accessible interface, then of course there will be no people with disability interacting with our service. And finally, accessibility does not have any return of investment. This is like the, uh, another businessy approach, let's say, um, where people consider that like, okay, you, you do some accessibility issues and you deal with them at the end of the project scope in the same realm with like supporting legacy browsers or I don't know, these kind of uh, ongoing nitty gritty tasks. Uh, the problem is that uh, people, again, don't have the exact numbers, the exact data, according to the World Report on Disability, which this is pretty old, it was published in 2011, there are around 1 billion people in the world with some form of disability. Out of those, 110 to 190 million have significant difficulties in functioning. There are 65 plus million visually impaired people. Uh, they, they fall, of course, into the, to the, to the smaller number there, but still, it's quite a huge number. So if you're actually planning to address the whole web, the whole population of, of, the, of the planet, then there's a lot of business here. There's a lot of potential revenue that you're basically just dropping because you have no, you give no access to, to a lot of people to your, to your services. Okay, but let's talk a bit maybe outside 
uh, accessibility, sorry, outside disability. We, we, we kind of like associated it for now, right? Accessibility for people with disabilities, but let's try to figure out the greater spectrum of, of accessibility if you want. This is for me stage number three, when you understand that it's not just about the people with uh, permanent disability. The thing is that every one of us can be affected in a way by, certain, by a certain degree by anything re related in a way or another to, to accessibility. So I'm going to give you a couple of user personas here uh, that are, in my opinion, are kind of like candidates for also being, um, also having trouble accessing or using services uh, in certain scenarios. So, for example, Alice is a mom with two kids, two small kids. Uh, she's trying to buy stuff or, online or navigate the web. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you have, I, I don't have it, I just heard stories, but having two small kids, I imagine it's pretty hard to navigate the web using a mouse and a keyboard. You usually have one hand, maybe both hands uh, tied to something. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's, the, and, and also it's the same scenario, for example, when you have a broken arm, so something like a temporary disability. So for example, in this case, keyboard navigation, <coughs> sorry, keyboard navigation is really useful for, uh, for a lot of people. Now let's take Bob. Uh, Bob is in his 70s, maybe 80s, and Bob is a user of the internet. Bob is getting older, the, um, he starts losing his eyesight, like he starts having maybe tremors associated with old age, lack of accuracy when, when navigating using a mouse or trackpad or whatever. And you might say, okay, yeah, but how many people are using the internet at 70 plus? Well, think about what will happen in 20 years from now when most of the people in the world will be using the internet because they will be I mean, I'm pretty sure that any, everyone in this room will still like to be using the internet the same way at 80, at 90, and, and so on. Um, Charlie here is another example. Uh, she lives in a country where internet access is very expensive or limited. Not Romania, definitely not Romania. We're, we're blessed with very cheap and fast internet. But there are a lot of countries in the world where actually you have to figure, you have to think, how much am I paying to navigate this website? Is it like, I don't know, the, how much data does it cost me? If it downloads two, three, four megabytes of data, then maybe that's a lot to pay. Maybe you have a, 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 a data plan limit. There are a lot of countries that limit it, for example, to 100 megabytes. Okay, how much internet can you, how, much, how many websites can you visit in there? So all, all of a sudden, like the performance aspect of the websites, how performant are, how, how optimized they are for mobile usage, for example, is becoming an accessibility issue as well. If your website is downloading hundred, uh, I don't know, megabytes, tens of megabytes of data, then basically you're blocking access to it indirectly through cost. And finally, Dominique um, lives in a country where English is not Nat the native language and is not maybe the first spoken language. Uh, and there are a lot of countries in the world where very few people actually speak English. There are a lot of countries in the, in the, in the Spanish-speaking world. There are a lot of countries in Asia. And we don't have content for them. We only have content in English. So have, not having translations basically, again, is kind of like blocking the service for a lot of users. And Finally, one last example, I will actually give me as an example. So uh, I just noticed this uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, I have Evernote, right? And I, I wanted to check my notes. I was somewhere, not with, I didn't have my laptop on me. I wanted to check them online. So I opened Evernote to, to log into my account. And when I go to the Evernote page, it says, sorry, Evernote web is not supported on Android browsers. And I don't have, like, this is not a legacy phone. This is just an Android phone, right? 80% of the world has it. So again, Evernote is making a decision to block my access to the service. OK, it doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter that I, I can use the app. Maybe I don't want to install the mobile app. There, there are so many reasons why 
internet, like web access should be allowed on, on mobile devices. So you see, like kind of like the spectrum, it can go from people with permanent disabilities to people with temporary disabilities to pretty much everyone in the world. That's why coming back to, to, to my original idea, accessibility is designing for people, understanding who are the users, how we can better serve them, what are their needs. And in this stage, like the human side of accessibility, this is where we try to understand what are the needs of our users. And the problem here is that, I'm, I'm trying to point to everyone somehow here, uh, the problem is mostly a developer community. So d developers are those who work on the interfaces. It, it is fundamentally our job to make sure that we get educated in what it means to build an accessible interface and to actually make it happen, uh, whatever the, like, the time constraints or the business constraints we live in. But it's kind of like this problem of developer experience versus user experience, right? DX versus UX. On one hand, we are thinking of our selfish needs, like I need to learn this, I need to have, I, I like building with this architecture in mind because it helps me because I just type in three things and it, it, it just works. Uh, I like this kind of framework, I like that kind of framework, this kind of database, that kind of database. These are all decisions that we make for our benefit. But then we have to make decisions for the benefits of the user, right? UX. Um, and I think this is where we mostly fail. We, we fail to realize that, hey, we are actually building for someone first, and then we should think about how to reuse that. I actually like this quote from uh, Ralph Johnson, before software can be reusable, it first has to be usable. Uh, Ralph Johnson is one of the authors of the famous uh, Gang of Four Design Patterns book. Um, and it's, it's really, it's really I, I, I like this quote, so I think I, I've, been, I've been putting it in slides for like two or three years. Because it actually tells like the, the essence of this, right? We are always eager to go to jump into a project and say, oh, okay, let's build this architecture. How will we be reusing it later? Like, do we do like microservices? Do we do that? Do we do this? Does it help us in, in, in our need? But we very, very... Um, Seldomly do we think like how does a decision that I take now impact the users of, of, this, of this application. So let's talk a bit about user experience and then we jump into some more in-depth or hands-on if you want accessibility um, things. So uh, first of all, what is user experience? Let's try to define it. I, I, I have a feeling that a lot of people understand by user experience those nice little things that we add on top of the interfaces, right? The user flows, the, the nice design quirks. Um, and terribly sorry for putting this slide up before lunch break, but the way I see user experience is that we have kind of like user needs and user delights, right? Food, you have the basic food needs. Hopefully, everyone considers this okay as a food need. You have the food delights, okay? This is optional, right? In the same way, user experience, the, 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 the nice little things, they are optional. The user needs, the fundamentals, those are not optional. So what are those fundamentals? I, we're talking about needs here, so I kind of like went along and went with a parallel with the, the human needs, right? So let's build a pyramid of the user needs. Considering what we just talked for like 20 minutes, what is the fundamental need? What, is, what should go there, the bottom one? Anyone? It is availability and accessibility. So fundamentally, whatever you are building, however fancy it is, whatever decision you made for a design system and so on, if you're not building, if, if I don't have access to your service, if it's not available for me in a certain country, in a certain scenario, in a certain context, then it fails. It, it doesn't, doesn't work, doesn't, doesn't, nothing else matters here. The next one is safety and privacy, right? Security. Is it, I know, do we care about this? Yes, we should care because this can impact the user. Loss of data, loss of private data, 
uh, security breaches, and so on and so forth. Then we have convenience and cost, which is kind of like the performance aspect of, of software, right? Like how much does the user have to wait before actually seeing something on the screen? How much data do they download? How much does it cost to, to, to access the website? There's actually a, a website called What Does My Website Cost? And it will show you in all sorts of countries around the world how much does it cost con compared to like, the data plans that they have there. It's quite an interesting exercise to do. Um, and at the very top, we have that <laughs> delightful experience. Like this is, unfortunately, people, UX, usually people see this side, right? Like, how do we draw the user into giving three clicks and shopping away with something? Or how do we uh, do, we do like, I don't know. The, the problem is, fundamentally, is you can consider the pyramid as how our priorities should be divided as developers, right? As, as sorry, as uh, anyone uh, basically involved in the technical process, because this is also designers, this is also even the business side. So everyone, everyone involved, all, all the key players here. The problem is that our priorities are usually like this, right? We spend an enormous amount of time thinking whether this shade of red will may be better for the user. This, this will persuade the user better to buy this thing, whether this button should be placed here or 20 pixels above. You know, all these kind of these decisions, which we awfully, we, we spend a lot of time on them. Then we might spend some time on convenience and cost on performance, because we know performance drives revenue. Sometimes it's very important to have, like there are a lot of studies showing that if your website doesn't load in five seconds, the user just leaves. So yeah, you care about that. Then you might care about safety and privacy because you heard some companies actually got bankrupt when they got sued because they had uh, data loss. And finally, if you do have some time, maybe you care about the, the accessibility part that's right at the end. So my goal, in, like, kind of like in speaking about accessibility, is also giving you this kind of pyramid of, of user needs. And turning it around. I would very much like us as, an, as the engineering process we develop right in, in, uh, in modern companies, I would like us to focus from the bottom up here, right? To focus on accessibility, focus on security, on performance, and yeah, also focus on what we've traditionally been calling user experience, but just figuring out that we are actually doing user experience from the first day, right? Everything you do here is part of user experience, whether it's a user need or user delight. Um, so yeah, let's talk about the practical side a bit. Now we kind of like went through the, let's say not necessarily the theoretical part, but we, um, we talked about why it's important to, 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 be, to build, right, to, to have accessibility in mind when you're building interfaces. So on the practical side, I'm going to go through a couple of ideas, a couple of common problems that exist in interfaces, especially, of course, in web interfaces, um, some solutions to them, and like basically opening the, the, the discussion if you want. There are, a lot, there are a ton of other problems, of course, and we can talk about, I think, two or three hours about it, but I'm just going to briefly uh, talk about three categories of problems that we have and that you can that we can solve right as on the during the engineering process so we're going to start with a visual one just again just to again i have this a lot of people have this pre preconception again if you talk about accessibility they initially say oh okay it's screen reader support no there are a lot of visual aspects of accessibility that we have to take into consideration. And the first one is color contrast. And actually, this is the biggest accessibility problem worldwide. The fact that uh, one in 12 males and one in 200 females suffer from color blindness, some degree of color blindness. Uh, a lot of people have eyesight problems in general. Uh, so color contrast is really important a lot of people have uh, different devices that they use. Maybe they use a mobile phone outside when it's sunny. So you, you, you can 
I'm pretty sure you, you were in some situation where, where color contrast was not enough. So color contrast is computed as the ratio between the foreground color and the background color. Of course, black on white or white on black gives the biggest ratio. It's around 16 to 1. Uh, and it falls down. It drops the more grayish uh, text you, you put on, on white. Uh, there are a, a couple of standards here uh, proposed by WCAG. And the, 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 the most common one is the AA standard, which says that all foreground to background contrast ratios should be above 4.5 to 1. Uh, again, this is a very interesting exercise to go on a website and see if uh, color contrast problems happen or not. And most of the cases, like in, I think in 80% of the scenarios, you will find color contrast problems. There are a lot of tools. We'll talk about tools uh, towards the end. There are a lot of tools that automate this process, and you can check that. Um, we don't have to manually check every time you put something there. You should, of course, prioritize text when it comes to color contrast. So, of course, borders like mar uh, borders of I know buttons, inputs, uh, separators, those are not that important. They are visible, more visible even in low contrast ratios. But text can be difficult. Of course, you should also prioritize for smaller text. But we'll talk about typography in a second. Uh, there's also this tool online, Color Contrast Checker, which gives you both the, dub, the double A pass and the triple A. Triple A is even more restrictive. It says that it should be uh, 7.5 to 1 for uh, big text and another value I can remember it now for, for small text or the other way around. Anyway, you can find it online. The standard is there. Um, Furthermore, there's also, speak, speaking about color blindness, red might not all be red for everyone, right? You might not see the same color, the same shade of red. So when dealing with, for example, form validation, it's important to add pattern, to add any kind of iconography or whatever you call it to, to, any, uh, to any color. So color should not be the only visual separator, or the only, the only thing that transmits information in this case. And there's this very good article at the bottom here uh, about, build, about color accessibility in general and how you should accompany these colors with patterns and stuff like that. Um, typography now. Uh, I specifically put this here because the website that we are building should not be an eye test for the user. That's definitely the rule. So you should keep the minimum of 16 pixels text if possible. Uh, I've seen websites go even to a minimum of 18. Um, it's kind of like a lot, a lot of modern designs that take into consideration, for example, typography. You won't see smaller texts anymore. This used to be a trend like five, ten years ago, but it's not anymore. Um, font family can be kept, should be kept consistent, right? Try not to mess too much with that. If you have two font families, that's fine. If it's three, then eh, maybe it's too much. Um, if you want to have uh, readable text, a lot of you know a lot of text input, you should constrain it to a, around 80 characters per line because otherwise either people are just going to do like that all the time, or simply it's very hard to keep up mentally to with the text because. Um, <clears throat> There are a lot of studies on this, uh, on this particular thing. Uh, try to use standard paragraphs, letter spacing. This improves readability and, and read the reading process for everyone. And another article at the bottom about all of these things related to typography. And now animations. <laughs> um, usually when I, when I bring this up, people are not really uh, agreeing with me. But um, the thing is that. Again, we have to know the user. Uh, there are a lot of people in the world that suffer from something called the vestibular disorder. So they basically have problem with uh, the equilibrium center in the inner ear, and they have various problems with uh, unexpected motion. Right? When you scroll a page, your expectation is that the whole content scrolls uniformly. When you have parallax event, it just messes up with your brain. So People with this kind of disability can suffer from like mild headaches to nausea, 
depending on the amount of animations that you throw at them. So try to not have parallax, try to not have scroll to e effects. Those are even worse, like scrolling through 2,000 pixels of content in one second simply makes you dizzy. Like it, it, it's, it doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Um, no unexpected transitions like pop-ups flying in from the left, uh, add banners that are covering the entire content and are flashing right content. Especially the Romanian websites are really bad at this. They they like they have no I don't know no ethics if you want in uh, in how they in, in the the amount the, the the type of content that they put online. Um, and there's also a nice trick you can do uh, if you really want to keep animations. There's uh, a new kind of media query here. So if the user in, on their device, for example, in, in, on, on the mobile phone, on some of the laptops have accessibility tabs, and you can stick there that you prefer reduced motion in the operating system. So like transitions don't become 3D cube renders and stuff like that. They're just like you know, regular transitions. Uh, browsers take that setting and they pass it on to, uh, to the websites. And you can use media queries like this. If the user has the reduce option on, you can basically disable some animations, or you can make them uh, less intrusive if you want. And this is uh, supported in Chrome, Firefox, and Safari. And interestingly, Safari, although it's usually credited as the new Internet Explorer of browsers, Actually, Safari is the most thoughtful browser when it comes to accessibility uh, implementation. So there's the first browser that usually ships these kind of changes. A lot of links about uh, reduced um, uh, motion. And there's also this really good link at the bottom, um, a very good article on uh, basically designing safe animations for web uh, sensitivity for for web for motion sensitive people uh, it's quite something that you can basically do a whole talk only on building safe animations and how you compose vectorial animations and stuff like that so it's, it's really interesting just to just to see how let's say complex it can get if you want okay we we talked about the visual let's talk about semantics a bit so Semantic, what I mean by that is, of course, I mean the, the meaning of what we are building, right? HTML, how, is, how semantic is the HTML that we are building? So um, just a quick recap, right? HTML gets parsed by a browser. The DOM tree is constructed together with the CSS on tree. Everything is visually rendered, right? The visual representation. What browsers also do, they construct out of the DOM something called the accessibility tree. This is based on semantics. This is based on ARIA labels that you might be familiar with. Uh, and that accessibility tree is what screen readers basically use to convey back information. The same kind of information that you heard at the beginning, right? They will detect uh, landmarks. They will detect links, buttons, uh, read and read the text. Uh, around page semantic, of course, the most important thing for a user who cannot see the website is to understand what are the main areas, right? If everything is a div here, it's called div fest, you're basically not conveying any information, right? So you have to clearly define the landmarks. This is a header. This is the main tag. This is where the content should, the, the content will focus after that. Navigation is expressed also. Hey, you're on a navigation uh, element now. Inside navigation, you can have you should have a, usually a list, right? An unordered list with list items. Those will be your navigation links. You could uh, most of the browser. Uh, sorry, uh, on uh, OS X, you have uh, by default you have um, screen read a screen reader. Uh, voiceover, you can install other screen readers on any operating system. You can just test out websites to see what a big difference it is to have these landmarks and to not have them. And of course, you should try to navigate the website without your screen on, 
because then it's then it's really interesting to see. Um, headings in the right order. This is one of the biggest problems with accessibility usually, right? I need this heading bigger. I'll just put it as an H1. It's bigger than an H2. Uh, this is the, the kind of problem, the kind of like stupid mistake that I was doing also at the beginning, right? Because no one ever told me that headings are actually there to convey information, to transmit meaning and not to scale the text. There's font size for that. So you should always have a single H1 on a page. You should have H2s in the, in the correct order, then H3s, basically the same way as you would write, as you would for read a, an article, a technical article or, or a book if you want, right? Headings are basically entering into a new area, entering into a new chapter. And there are a lot of screen reader users, and I've seen these, uh, there, there are uh, uh, some examples out there I can show you afterwards. A lot of screen reader users actually uh, have shortcuts for navigating through the headings, for example, on reading the news. If the news items are not properly s semantically uh, set with H1, H2, H3, then they will be unable to navigate quickly through the website to get to the information that they are interested in. And they will have to go, they will have to wait and listen to all the content before figuring out, hey, where do I need to go, actually? Uh, label tag also is really important for that because it conveys a lot of information about uh, forms, about elements, about things like that. Uh, a couple of examples of, of common scenarios or common controls that we use, right? A menu, like I said, the menu should be a nav, inside the nav, uh, nav uh, element. It should, be create, it should be as an unordered list of list items. If it's a drop-down menu, then it should be another unordered list inside that list items with the next list items. This ensures by default that you have keyboard uh, accessibility, keyboard navigation in, an, in a list. By do, go, going with an arrows left and right, you actually can navigate through the elements. Um, images and links. Again, clear titles for links. Avoid this kind of click here and read more links. Because again, as a shortcut, a lot of users will go and say, Oh, I want to just tab my way through the links. And then the links will say, click here, click here, click here, click here. And they, they will get no information of that. So always try to put the link around the text that makes sense so that the link is understandable when you read it out loud. Or use a title or, um, or something like that. For images, again, it, uh, the alt text is really important. If you don't have that, then the name of the image is being read by the screen reader. Do you know how the image is usually named? D X F O M O zero nine, and I can go on forever. And the screen reader actually reads that because they have no other information to, to read back to the user. As a side note, there is interesting. There are a lot of interesting projects on machine learning on trying to analyze an image and generating automatic alt text, which is really really cool and a really nice use case for for machine learning and technology. And it actually works. I've seen a lot of demos of that work. Um, OK. Then we go to interaction, the last part. So keyboard navigation was already mentioned. Uh, notice here, on, on C this is on CSS tricks. Maybe I should have made it a bit bigger. Uh, as I'm navigating my way through the, um, the interface, I'm using the tab. Here. So I'm focused on that, and I just tab my way through the relevant content. And you see, as I'm, as I'm doing the tab, the animation also happens, right? So the, the same kind of animation that happens when you hover over elements in the visual, in the visual environment, when you're tabbing your way using keyboard navigation, that also should happen. The same way on the, on the, on the JS Heroes website, we have, uh, when we present the speakers, uh, here is me actually just tabbing my way through the speakers. Uh, most of the time, this is done by syncing up the, uh, the focus and uh, the hover events in CSS. Sorry, the pseudo selectors. Uh, again, like I mentioned, for menus and lists, it's crucial to have support for left, right, up, down arrows, for tab 
tabbed interfaces again, switching between tabs should be uh, done by the <clears throat> by arrows again. If you have a model, it should have escape, enter, right? The 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 the, the custom, let's say, the, the custom uh, kind of uh, things and the expected kind of behavior um, in there. This one, I really hate it. This is awful. Um, this is actually taken from one of the first versions of Reset CSS, and it had a comment there, remember to define focus styles. Yeah, bullshit, no one was reading the comments, of course, and they were just taking this kind of Reset CSS thing, and all of a sudden, on all the websites, you drop any kind of outline support. When you're navigating through the, with a keyboard, you have literally no idea where you are if you don't have outline. Um, this is something I found on a, on a website recently also. Outline non-important. Because fuck you, that's why. So never do outline zero, outline none, removing outline. Uh, style your own outline. If you have a design that really is, looks bad, like with a the default browser outline, just, just style your own outline because it's not that hard. Or even better, you can actually support just the keyboard outline. So this small little package here, what input, will give you a kind of selector that will say, uh, when the user focuses on an input or on a button using the mouse, don't show outline. You can disable the outline. But when the focus is done using the keyboard, then the outline will be there. So then at least you have, you make sure that uh, users who have a mouse don't see that ugly outline that we consider. But on the other hand, uh, users that are actually doing keyboard navigation can get the full experience. Focus, like I said, should accompany things like hover, right? If you're, if you're using some sort of CSS rules on when you're hover over an element, you should also use the same rules when focusing on those elements because then keyboard navigation will have the same effect as hovering. Uh, when you do on click on, an, on a button, um, you should also, uh, we should also make sure that you do, uh, or, or sorry, when you do, not on click, that's a mistake there, when you do like on mouse over, right, on mouse in, mouse out, depending on the frame or depending on how it's implemented, you should also do focus in parallel. <clears throat> Tab index, if you ever use tab index, uh, you should just keep in mind that the, f the natural flow of the tab is also expected by keyboard navigation, so you don't do like jumps and skips and stuff like that. Uh, try to focus, to, to, to trap the focus in, in loop, uh, in, uh, sorry, in a, <clears throat> in a model window, so that when you open a model window, I cannot tab my way outside the model and just start scrolling on the page uh, in the back because it's quite annoying. Um, and this is also very important for screen reader users. Uh, make sure you handle focus after navigation. A lot of modern websites, because they have these browser-based uh, routings, when you navigate to a certain page, you actually don't do a page reload. When you don't do a page reload, the focus is not positioned on the first focusable element, as it would naturally be. So uh, this is a problem that m in most of the fr modern frameworks, React, Angular, Vue, I, I, I researched a bit, and you have to do it by hand. You have to either have some sort of element that you automatically focus on when you're navigating or, or this kind of behavior. Um, hopefully, it will improve, but just, just as a reference, this is important because when a screen reader user will navigate to a page, they'll have no idea where they are if you're not handling it. And finally, touch area. Uh, this is specifically, of course, for touch devices, for mostly for mobile. Um, I'm pretty sure you went to websites which was really hard to tap on something because it was a very small little icon there that you had to open something. Um, you should use paddings to increase the touch area. It's recommended that you have at least 44 pixels of, of, of screen as a, for, for the touch event. Otherwise, it can get hard on, uh, on, on doing that. Um, also, uh, the, 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 the labels should be added for 
uh, for like toggle buttons when you when you're focusing on uh, on the element it's kind of like similar as a hover if you want but like conveying again more information to the user and finally let's get to tools uh, how much time do I have not a lot okay so like I mentioned, there are a lot of screen readers that you can use to test websites. VoiceOver is a default one on, uh, on Macs. Uh, JAWS is for Windows. Orca is for Linux, I think. And NVDA is also for Windows. These are pretty popular. Um, you can, um, there are a lot of, there are more also. There are some open source. I, I haven't tested a lot of them. I mostly use VoiceOver on, on the Mac, and it's, it's really interesting to see. Um, how uh, how it works. Uh, Xcore is a great library that you can add to your project. Um, it will basically do end, like an end-to-end -end test for accessibility issues on pages. You can integrate it with anything like Cypress or Test Cafe or whatever you're using for end-to-end -end tests. Uh, and it will give you basically out-of-the-box tests for most of the accessibility issues for uh, contrasts for headings which are not in the right order and for like all the all the basic things that we, we discussed about today. Lighthouse um, is another great project that can give you a lot of information. They have an accessibility audit. So if you, Lighthouse is integrated in Chrome. If you just open DevTools and you go to audits, you can check the accessibility audit. It will give you an accessibility score. And again, color contrast, things like uh, alt for images, titles for links, um, again, things related to, to headings and the order of the headings, those are all, um, are all addressed by, by Lighthouse. Um, and this is another uh, quick little tool that you can use. <clears throat> you can actually drop it in as a, as a, as a plugin in your, in, on top of your website, and it will give you la, uh, in real time as you're, as you're coding in your local environment, it will give you an overlay with common accessibility issues. Uh, it's called Totally. Uh, by the way, A11Y, it's pronounced Ali, and it's a numeronym where you take the first letter of accessibility and the last one and the number of letters in between so that you don't pronounce accessibility, accessibility, accessibility. The same when same with internationalization, <clears throat> I-18-N. Okay, cool. Hope at least you learned something today. <laughs> okay, uh, just two other projects that I want to mention here. Reach UI is a library for uh, accessible uh, components for React. Uh, they are handling these kind of common scenarios. For example, the Reach Router will handle focus after navigation. Um, there are a lot of uh, elements here like models that have keyboard support, tabs that are fully accessible and stuff like that. Uh, inclusive Components is another great project. Uh, this designing, basically, this is also kind of like an ebook as well if you want. It's, it's available online. You can read about how to design an accessible uh, like toolbar, how to design an accessible tab interface and stuff like that. And yeah, that's, that's about it. I know we talked about a lot of things, and like the, it looks like the, I know, all of a sudden you have to learn a whole new deal of problems and a whole new deal of, of um, there are a lot of solutions for that. Um, how I see accessibility is that you learn it once and then you bake it in into your software process, right? You bake it once you're aware of this. Uh, like just two days ago, I started building, for example, an, a new page on a website and. I just realized that, oh, yeah, I'm already doing this because that's the way in which I'm building websites. I don't have to think it, oh, first I build the interface, then I make it accessible. Um, i like to leave you with this quote, be inspired by what you don't know. Uh, I was once unaware completely of what accessibility means, of what you can do with it, why is it helpful for some people, and why we should handle it. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's really interesting to, to go down this path. Uh, I think it's our job as engineers, it's our job as technical people to take ownership of these problems. The business side will not prioritize this. We have to understand our relationship with the user, the fact that we impact the, the user, basically, and 
the last thing is I hope that at least this is kind of like uh, the, the takeaway if you want. Uh, a lot of people consider that working on accessibility is about doing someone a favor. I think it's actually doing your job. Thank you. Okay, do we have questions or you want to come here and we can talk? We can do, or we can go to lunch, however you want. Mic one, mic two. Um, thanks for the talk. My question is regarding, you showed the py pyramid and the reverse pyramid. Mm -hmm. Basically the reverse pyramid, like the, the awesome, cool, user, flashy thingies, that's where the money is. That's where the stakeholders want to see stuff. So you have like a, a burden of like delivering something super cool, but also making it uh, accessible with a limited budget. So if the company for the first time has to do this, like how do you, because I think developers usually want to help other people. But like, yeah, I know. Uh, I'm going to go to it, hopefully, just to have it in the background. Um, so the, the, way I can, the way I see it is that, yeah, okay, this is the money maker, but this is basically what can kill you if you do it wrong. So take, for example, like Domino Pizza. They were sued for like, I don't know what amount of money, millions of dollars, because, they were, because someone mm -hmm. using a screen reader was not able to order pizza, right? Um, safety also, safety and privacy. Like think of all the cases that you've seen recently of companies going bankrupt or basically losing any kind of um, respect, if you want, for simply like, a, a small issue that they, uh, yeah, they consider it a small issue, right, in their code base. The fact that I, I know they weren't validating for uh, XSS or they had uh, data breaches in their, their, their password for the website, for the database was admin, admin. <laughs> um, I think it's, 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 again, it's our job to, con to convince the business side that, hey, yeah, we know the money is here, but these things, are actually can kill us, right? These, these things can put us out of business. This might give us an edge. Uh, and also, maybe we don't need to convince that this is another thing. Maybe we don't need to convince anyone to implement this. Maybe we just do it because that's how we work. If we can turn the engineering process so that it focuses on these things, you don't even have to tell the manager or the business person, yeah, I am taking some days to implement an accessible interface. No. When they ask you how much does it take, you say how much does it take because you know it will also, you also take some time to make it accessible or working on all the browsers. It's the same kind of mindset. They shouldn't be, business people should not care about, I mean, they should care, but if they don't care, they, you just leave them alone. You just <laughs> do the estimates so that you, you take consideration for that. <laughs>